Okay, good morning. So we just introduced the trapezoidal rule, which is an integral approximation technique. So delta x over two, then f of x sub zero plus, and now all of these terms get two within them, except for the first term and the last term, which just exist on their own. And as a reminder of the picture here, we've got a curve, we want the area under, well, we want the integral. The curve doesn't have to be positive. I just draw it that way for convenience. We cut this curve into equal sized pieces. The beginning and end points of these pieces are the x's that you see in the formula. And although you don't really need to know this to use the formula, you should know what the trapezoidal rule is doing, which is creating trapezoids like this. And then finding the area of each trapezoid and adding those areas together. At least um, that's the easiest way to think of it when the curve is entirely positive. And we see in this picture, if you um, let your x's be close enough together, that is to say, Come on, Zoom, work with me. If we let this delta x be small, then the areas of the trapezoids do a very good way of approximating the area under the curve. All right. And we could do just um, an example given a function the way we did with um, the midpoint rule. In fact, I guess we probably should, even though um, doing numerical approximation by hand is not the most edifying part of this course, but Let's say f of x equals, um, I don't, know, one over the sine of x plus two on, let's keep our life easy or relatively easy. Let's have a nice interval on zero to one. And let's say we want to use four rectangles. Again, this is just for illustrative purposes. In the real world, you'd be doing this on a computer and you could easily use a thousand rectangles or 10,000, but we're using four to illustrate. So it doesn't actually matter what the curve looks like. We um, don't have to graph it if we don't want to. We should be certain that the curve is always defined, but it is. The sine of x plus two can't be zero. 
Delta X is B minus A all divided by the number of rectangles we want. So one fourth. So this is point five. Point two five. Point seventy five. And then we've got that zero and that one. And don't forget the end points, don't forget the zero and the one. Um, those are the terms that are not going to have twos attached to them. So we find delta x. We needed to find delta x anyway, because it tells us that these points we're looking for are a fourth apart, but we also need it because it shows up in the formula. So be careful, we have two um, divisions here. We find delta x, it's a fourth, In the formula, that delta x is divided by 2, so it'll be an eighth. Then 1 over the sine of 0 plus 2 plus 2 times 1 over the sine of 0 0.25 plus 2, plus 2 times 1 over the sine of 0 0.5 plus 2. I think I used the phrase, I'll make this easy on myself. This is going to be such a pain to plug in, but plus this, one over the sine of 0 0.75 plus 2. And now that we reach the end, we reach 1. So there is no multiplication by 2 here. Okay, well, in spite of my describing it as a pain, this shouldn't be hard. It's just a bunch of parentheses and making sure we don't hit the wrong button. So one divided by, let's see, the sine of zero plus Two. Let me. Yes, this is the form that we're working with. It is the sine of zero plus two, and now plus, and now two times two times. Speaking of not hitting the wrong button, one divided by the sine of 0.25 plus 2, and parentheses, plus 2 times, second time in a row I did that, 2 times, 1 divided by the sine of I need parentheses around the denominator of the fraction if it's going to have um, addition in it. Plus two, let's see, end parentheses. 
plus two times one divided by the sine of 0 0.75 plus two and parentheses plus and now we don't have a two because we're at our, the end. One divided by the sine of one plus two, end parentheses, end parentheses. Um, and because of the order of operations, I didn't we can, um, when we want to multiply two by a fraction, that's the same as just first multiplying by the numerator and then dividing. So I think these are all the parentheses we need. Hit error, get our approximation. Probably not a great approximation with only four rectangles. Let's see what Wolfram Alpha thinks of this. Integral from zero to one of one divided by the sine of x plus two. Wolfram Alpha does something. I have no idea what's going on behind the hood to give us this inverse tangent and all this, but it thinks it's about 0 0.41083. So with four rectangles, we're correct to two decimal places. I mean, Wolfram Alpha is, is obviously also grounding, but we can take it as granted that this decimal they're giving us is correct. It's keeping many more decimal places than our calculator. So the reason I mean, I said yesterday, I introduced the midpoint rule and then said, well, we don't really use the midpoint rule a lot, which is probably not a very encouraging thing to hear when you're, um, when you're learning new material, but there are national standards, so I can't help it. Um, the reason I say you probably don't use the midpoint rule a lot is that the trapezoidal rule is faster, by which I mean that a computer using the trapezoidal rule will get a better approximation faster than a computer using the midpoint rule. <laughs> Something else you can do with the trapezoidal rule that you really can't do with the midpoint rule is something like the following. So here's a classic example. Area under a plasma drug concentration. So we're in a hospital setting, let's say, and we're looking at the concentration of a drug in the patient's body, and we are monitoring this by looking at it periodically. So let's say we look at it at midnight at 1 a.m. at 2 a.m. at 3 a.m. 
and at 4 a.m. So we know how much, um, we know the concentration of the drug during the night. And let's say we ask the following question. How much of this drug has the patient been exposed to. So we know the concentration of the drug at any moment, but we want the total exposure. Oh, I don't know if this is totally obvious, but the total exposure is the area under the drug concentration curve. Um, thinking about this informally, I mean, you can think of the concentration as a rate milligrams per liter. So if you want the milligrams, well, the, a rate is a derivative. Derivatives and integrals cancel out. So if you integrate milligrams per liter, you wind up with milligrams, essentially. So from a uh, pure mathematics use integration by parts, use U substitution, use whatever point of view. We're obviously in trouble here because we need the area under a curve, only we don't have a curve. We just have a bunch of discrete observations. Well, something like this is a classic example of Simpson, not Simpsons, I'm getting ahead of myself, is a classic example of the trapezoidal group. We have an interval that interests us. Let's try to do a slightly better job of equally spacing these. We know what this curve is doing. At these points, we don't know what the curve is. But whatever the curve is, we want the area under it. And of course, the instant I say we don't know what the curve is, well, there go all of our other techniques out the window. We can only try to approximate this. And the classic assumption is, okay, well, if we don't know what the curve is, we might as well just pretend that it's a straight line connecting these points. And to find the area under these straight lines is exactly what Simps second time today, is exactly what the trapezoidal rule gives us. So, what did I do? My whiteboard vanished. Here it's back again. 
So to use the trapezoidal rule, we need delta x. Delta x is the length of one of these intervals. It's 4 minus 0 over 4, but we can just look at the data. We're looking at the drug concentration every hour. Delta x is 1. So delta x, which is 1, divided by 2 times the first value, 100, plus twice the second value, plus twice the third value, I've got these values in my notes. I can just read them off. Twice the fourth value. And then the last value doesn't get the two. First and last values don't get two. And doing this by hand won't be painful because we're just, I mean, not literally by hand, but typing it into the calculator will be a lot less painful than that first example. But 100 plus 2 times the next value plus 2 times the next value plus two times the next value plus the last value, end parentheses. We think that the total drug exposure is about 218.5 milligrams. And I mean, again, you wouldn't do this in, by hand, but this is what? I mean, the hospital machines are doing. There is no, there is no secret better way of approximating the area that we're not teaching you in this situation, where we have a table of values, the trapezoidal rule is it. And the trapezoidal rule doesn't strictly require that all of these observations be equally spaced out. So like on a computer, it wouldn't really matter if they aren't. We'll always assume that the um, intervals are equally spaced. So we can use this nice formula. The trapezoidal rule becomes messier without that assumption. <laughs> that leaves us now well, questions about the trapezoidal rule. <laughs> so that leaves us um, with the rule that I have accidentally <laughs> mentioned twice already. That leaves us with Simpson's rule. And just to try to give some con Next. Simpson's rule is in general with a best, best in inverted, uh, best in scare quotes um, of these three rules. It's faster than the trapezoidal rule. But, but to use Simpson's rule well, 
<laughs> you really need the function to get the best out of it. So Simpsons rule doesn't get used when you have a table like this. Simpsons rule gets used in situations like this, where we just have a function and we want the integral of the function. So the reason I said that best should go into scare quotes is that they're not really in direct competition. They're used in different situations to use different things. As the trapezoidal rule gets used in situations like this. Simpson's rule gets used in situations where we're just told, well, we've got We've got an integral. We can't find this integral by hand. Um, the two sine of x is easy, but the natural log of x squared is beyond us. How can we estimate this thing as quickly as possible? So Simpson's rule has a few requirements requirements that the trapezoidal rule doesn't have. Um, but that's not so much a weakness. You need the rectangles. We're once again going to use rectangles as it were or intervals of the same length. And we need an even number of them. So needing an even number and also needing the rectangles to be of the same length is why Simpson's rule really doesn't work well for situations like this, because their observations might not be the right number. You might have um, an even number of observations, which will give you an odd number of rectangles, and they might not be evenly spaced. I mean, it's all very well to say that the nurse is going to make observations every hour, but maybe she's delayed, or maybe she's a little early. And if you just mess around with your observations slightly, the trapezoidal rule still works here. It becomes a bit of a hassle because this nice formula no longer works. You have to actually find the areas of the trapezoids, but the trapezoidal rule still works here fundamentally, whereas Simpson's rule would totally break down. Simpson's rule requires an even number of equally spaced rectangles. So another thing that would break Simpson's rule is if you added a new observation. Now your rectangles, your intervals, I should say, between zero and one, one and two, two and three, four and five, Oh, you have an odd number 
of them. So Simpson's rule wouldn't work here. The trapezoidal rule would still work fine. So again, maybe, maybe I'm hammering this a little unnecessarily, but the Simpson's rule and trapezoidal rule really are sort of doing different things. The trapezoidal rule works great with tables. Simpson's rule doesn't work well at all with tables. The trapezoidal rule absolutely could use that to estimate that integral. It's pretty fast. Simpson's rule is faster, though. So they each have their place, but what is Simpson's rule? Why does it need an even number of rectangles? That's kind of an odd requirement. So we're not going to derive Simpson's rule, but I'll tell you where it comes from. Let's say we have two rectangles sitting next to each other. And we have a value for each, um, for each of those points. Well, with a few exceptions, I mean, they're not allowed to be on a straight line, but with that exception, if you have three points, you can draw a parabola that goes through the points. And the area under a parabola because a parabola is just a second degree polynomial, it's easy to integrate, we can find the area under a parabola. So what Simpson's rule is doing is it's looking at these intervals in groups of two, it's finding the parabolas that pass through those points. And then it's giving you the area under the parabolas. That's what Simpson's rule does. Um, but Simpson's this, I mean, this picture is going to remain firmly under the hood because actually finding those parabolas, how do you do it? That's something we probably don't know. Even if we do know how, it's an enormous pain. Um, <laughs> But if you know basically where Simpson's rule comes from, then it's kind of miraculous, but somehow you wind up with a pretty nice formula. You'd think this process would give, would be hard to do. Simpson's rule, look, something like the trapezoidal rule. So instead of delta x over two, there's delta x over three. We begin and end with the F value. And in the middle, we're going to have numbers in front of the F value. But here's where the difference comes in. With the trapezoidal rule, we have twos in front of everything. With Simpson's rule, 
We don't have fours in front of everything. Don't extrapolate from this. With Simpson's rule, the number in front of these middle terms alternates between zero and four. Sorry, between two and four. Um, the first and last terms are always four. Well, the last last term is just one, but um, the first term that has a number in front of it and the last term that has a number in front of it, that number is four. And if you can remember what the first number is, you'll get the last number being four automatically. So, why don't I, why don't I make my life slightly easier and remove that sign of X, but let's use Simpson's rule to try to find the integral of the natural log of X squared. Again, this is something that I do not know how to do by hand. Well, sort of know how to do by hand, but probably wouldn't if you challenged me to. Um, let's go from one to seven. And um, let's use a six intervals, or I guess once we actually start entering stuff into the calculator, it should be pretty quick. Let's use 10 intervals. and hope I don't regret it later. I mean, again, I'm trying to strike a balance. The more intervals we use, the more accurate our answer will be. But also I'm going to be entering this into my calculator by hand. So I don't want to use like a hundred rectangles. So delta x is still b minus a over the number of rectangles. So six tenths. And we'll start with one. So one is 10 tenths. Then we'll have 16 tenths. Then we'll have 21 tenths. And so on until we get to seven. Which is 70 tenths. So delta x divided by three, dividing a tenth by three gives us a thirtieth. And the next, um, oh, this is going to be messy to enter into my calculator after all, but I said I'd do it and I'll do it if I can. 
So we've got the function evaluated at the first value. Then we've got four times the function evaluated at the second value. Then we've got two times the function evaluated at the third value. Then we've got four, then we've got two, then we've got four, and we'll continue to repeat in this fashion, except for the very last value, that's 70 over 10, which will not have a number in front of it. So let's try this. Ah. So we should start with a big old parenthesis. The 630th is being multiplied by everything. And then, so we've got the natural log of One square plus four times the natural log of, okay, 16 over 10 squared. And if I've started that right, we should... Okay, just add six in the numerator, remembering to alternate between the fours and the two. So this is a four, the next will come a two, 21 over 10 squared is, I think that should be a 22, shouldn't it be? 16 plus six. Yeah, bad start. Thank you. Plus four, the natural log of 28 over 10 the whole thing squared plus two, the natural log of 34 over 10, the whole thing squared plus four, I feel like I'm doing ASMR or something here. Um, the next term should be 40 over 10, the whole thing squared, to the natural log of 46 over 10, the whole thing squared, four, the natural log of 52 over 10, the whole thing squared, two, 58, 
over 10. What was it I said that once I was entering this into my calculator, it wouldn't be so bad. My hub hubris got the best of me, but we're in the home stretch. Um, 64 over 10, the whole thing squared. And now 70 over 10 is our last term. As I predicted, by the way, we started with a four, we ended with a four. So last term, nothing's here. The natural log of well, 70 over 10 n is uh wow just tripped right on uh the finish line get rid of that what i wanted was parentheses Okay, and I very much hope this is what we were looking for. Again, I don't know how to actually find this integral, but checking our work is relatively easy because we have access to um, more advanced technology. Man, Desmos makes finding these integrals by, you know, finding them exactly look easy. I have no, oh my God. Yes, I, I know how to do this. You take the two in front of the logarithm because, okay, this, this, this is totally irrelevant to what we were doing. But since I have this great blast, I might as well share it. The logarithm of a power brings the power in front of the logarithm. That two comes out. And this is one of those sort of unusual applications of integration by parts. We let u be the natural log. We let dv be one dx. And we can proceed that way. But Anyway, in terms of the actual problem I was doing, which was trying to numerically estimate this, 15.241, a 15 uh, lot of work to be accurate to two decimal places. But again, you do not do Simpson's rule by hand outside of the classroom. All right, and starting tomorrow, we'll do a uh, material that I hope is a little more exciting than watching me thug stuff into the couch today,